Hello, everyone, and welcome to another GIC TV live interview here today on the Global Illumination Council. My name is Bernard Alvarez, and I am very lucky to be joined today by Gwilda Wayaka, and she is going to be speaking to us for the next hour. Uh, Gwilda, unfortunately, we did have some technical difficulties, so Gwilda will be joining us live. However, you will not be able to see her. We will be... Um, streaming her Skype, um, her Skype picture, so at least we know who we're talking to, and we're very happy that she's here joining us today. For those of you that do not know who Gwilda is, Gwilda is the founder and the director and the owner of Path Home Shamanic Art School. It's a state-certified occupational school that certifies and trains shamanic practitioners. As a preceptor for the University of Colorado School of Medicine, she provides instruction to medical doctors on the modern interface between shamanism and allopathic care. This is very important in today's world, by all means. Gwilda has studied shamanism for 40 years and has been a practitioner for 30 and a teacher of the shamanic arts since 1996. She conducts workshops and seminars throughout the world, and she is an inspirational speaker and singer, songwriter, wonderful. That's great to know. We might have to have you do a ditty here. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let's um, welcome Gwilda Wiaka. How are you today, Gwilda? Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Bernard. I'm doing well. Yourself? I'm doing very, very well. I've been looking forward to this. Uh, we've had you book for quite a while now, and uh, because of that, I've had the opportunity to um, to go and look at your YouTube videos, look through your website. And uh, it, it, I, I really, really align with your message, and I really align with what you're saying uh, on many levels. So I'm very happy that you're here joining us today. So thank you for uh, being a part of today's broadcast. Well, thank you. Um, let's start off, and I, I always like to start off with um, people, uh, what gets us to where we are? Why did we choose this path? How did we end up being where we are? What what? As some people say, what was it like and what, what, what's it like now? How did you get involved in the shamanic arts and how long have you been practicing? <laughs> well, I've, I've been uh, studying shamanism for over 40 years and practicing for over 30. I've been a teacher of the shamanic arts for better than 20 years. Um, so I'm giving away my age. Here we go. <laughs> but um, when I was growing up, I lived in very volatile situations. And um, I was a pretty sensitive child. So what I ended up doing was refining my empathy, if you will, in order to feel what was going to go on around me in order to stay safe. And um, it probably saved me, but it also made me extremely sensitive. And by the time I was in my early 20s, I was really failing. My uh, adrenals were shot. I was in fight or flight all the time. I was getting too much information from everywhere, almost like being autistic in an um, uh, empathic sort of way. And that's when I met my first teacher, who was a Lakota elder, and he probably saved my life. He taught me how, through using shamanic principle, that I could find the volume knob of my sensitivity, and it made all the difference in the world. So it was such a, a savior for me. I just kept studying it, and I've studied all sorts of different forms. And um, as I studied and looked into it deeper and deeper and deeper, I realized, you know, there's a lot more here than meets the eye. And I just fell in love, and here we are. Wow. So uh, you basically, I guess it's fair to say, because of the uh, experiences you had in your life, uh, it, it felt right for you. It was a good fit for you. Yes, it really was. And it's a place that I could use the strangeness about me, you know, being so sensitive and empathic in a, in a creative way for other people. Right, exactly, exactly. Now, I, 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 as I was reading your, your biography, and, and I don't know how much this has to do with um, how you became who you are, but you have a very interesting um, childhood. You grew up in Saudi Arabia. I don't know many <laughs> people that grew up in Saudi Arabia. Uh, tell us yeah. a little bit about growing up around the world. Oh, it was it was it was really a wonderful opportunity. You know, I was I was passed around a lot. I lived with a lot of different families from different cultures, and it, I ended up being so extremely adaptable because of it. But um, Saudi Arabia was very intense. It was. Um, well, it's a third world country at the time, and and uh, women were definitely one step below a camel. So, it was it was real interesting growing up in that framework. And I think the thing that I like most about having grown up in so many different and varied cultures is that my concept of reality was way broadened from if I hadn't been exposed to so many different people's viewpoints. I see. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's uh, I think that's very helpful in the work that uh, those of us that are involved in the spiritual arts uh, do. 
uh, creating that diversity and um, awareness of other cultures and and the sensitivity and uh, respect for it. Yeah, it's so important because, you know, now is a time when we really co- need to co- bring this thing back together before we blow ourselves apart. And yeah. it's, you know, when you've lived with someone and seen their family and see their love for each other, they aren't just the, the bad guys over across the ocean. They're people, too. And um, I, I really think that the more integrated we can become that way culturally, the better off we're going to be. That's very much, um, I feel it's very much a part of what we call um, the shift that's happening now is that understanding of all the different cultures and understanding uh, what what's important and that is a humanity uh, relating to one another exactly exactly this is a time of of you know coming into that unity and realizing that we're all cells of the same organism um and so you know that separateness that we've suffered from and been exploited by um is not going to be supported much longer yeah I'm, I'm, and I'm very happy about that as well. We see it, we see it falling by the wayside. Um, but, but let's save that that discussion for a little bit uh, further on into today's broadcast, as we're definitely going to cover that a lot more. Um, let's talk a little bit about the uh, all the diff- diverse topics that you um, that you write about. Uh, you write about uh, a, a shamanism, astrology, astronomy, physics, uh, nutrition, chakras, the mind calendar, indigenous legends. I mean, you have a wonderful diverse. Um, uh, focus in, in all of your writing. Yes, it's it's because, again, um, all of those have seemed diverse and unrelated, but as we're coming into the fifth world of unity, they're all interrelated, and the more we can understand them and use them to process and become more whole ourselves, the broader our uh, reach is in our personal power in the world. And with that, with that being said, what are, um, as these changes are happening, what are some of the ways that people have become disconnected from nature and what negative results are we experiencing from this particular disconnect? Yeah, that, that's what I love about the shamanic way is it is aligned with the law of nature. And over time, the law of nature is really the only thing that holds true. And yet, it's always shifting. So like the seasons are always shifting. The length of the days are always shifting. Where we are in the universe, in the galaxy, and how the galaxies interact with other galaxies is always shifting. And yet, we're subject to this. And shamanism aligns with the laws of nature at any given time. So if we can learn to do that, then we can work with the way nature is working and be supported by it rather than try to battle it. In our culture, what we've done is disconnected ourselves from nature as much as we can, thinking, oh, if it grew that way, surely we can find a better way to grow it. And if it if it came with this constituent parts, better, let's add some chemicals and let's make artificial light and let's lock ourselves away from, from the weather. And pretty soon, to our detriment, we have disconnected from the very thing that supports us, and that's the law of nature. I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I find that one of the motivating factors in the work that we do here, myself personally as well, is the fact that um, not only have we disconnected, but we're disrespecting nature. And uh, for me, I feel it is a part of becoming whole or becoming the whole being that we are, whether uh, as, as a physical and spiritual being, that uh, we rediscover uh, that, that energetic connection between us and nature. I feel that nature is um, always talking to us. Uh, like you said, we can see it in the change of seasons and the cycles of the, <coughs> excuse me, of the, of the, of the seasons. And um, we are also seeing it in, um, well, I'm very big on food integrity. And we're seeing that disconnect in, our, in, our, in the very food that we're, that we're buying in the grocery store. Yeah, I mean, it's it's scary. There's no food there. Unless you find an organic aisle, you're in trouble. Um, everything has been chemicalized and, and additives and preservatives and all that stuff to the point that the food value is almost nil. And you, you look at uh, the people in our culture, we're suffering, we're starving to death, and we're toxic. Um, you know, I, I had the, an interesting video come to me, not a video, just a, an email come to me the other day. And it was from the... Um, uh, some pictures taken in the 1940s. They were, you know, color slides in the 20s, 30s, 40s. And I was looking at those, and it was just amazing to me. All these people looked healthy, but there was pictures of crowds, of Fourth of July gatherings, of all this stuff, and there wasn't an obese person there. And now, if you take a picture of a crowd, you're hard pressed to find somebody that isn't either anorexic or obese. People are just not healthy, and we we don't seem to realize it. But that compromises our frequency. It also compromises our ability to move with life because we're disconnected through the very chemicals in our body. 
very much so. Very much so. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, that's a very great observation uh, as far as uh, seeing, uh, seeing the contrast between a you know, 4th of July celebration in the 40s versus today. <clears throat> and I can't help but wonder, uh, well, I don't really need to wonder, but uh, it, it seems fair to say, uh, to speculate that a lot of this comes from the fact that not only are we disconnected from nature, but that is being um, further, further celebrated, unfortunately, by the food industry in the fact that we have so many genetically modified products that are unnatural, that now we're seeing, uh, I mean, we're, we're seeing obesity in test rats when they're eating genetically modified food. So I can't help but, well, again, I think it's fair to speculate that um, because it is so unnatural that we are seeing such an unhealthy uh, majority in today's world. Yeah, it's it's interesting the way it, it works, though. It's like um, we're, we watch TV and it says, oh, this stuff, it tastes so good. It's the wonderful thing for you. The latest studies show that butter's no good. You better have margarine, blah, 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 blah. And um, so, of course, you like good, 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 good program people. We go out and we buy the margarine. And then we find out later that margarine actually was an experiment. They had created it to uh, fatten up turkeys. Uh, when they fed it to the turkeys, the turkeys all died. But they didn't want to waste all that money, so they paid for a study that shows that butter's bad, put some nice yellow dye in the margarine, and now sell it as something that's good for you. And, you know, our whole system is run by economy and taking from each other versus synergy you know it's parasitic in nature and so we eat these foods that compromise our health then we have to go to the food you know go food and drug it's no wonder they're associated together <laughs> then you have to go for drugs and the drugs are taken out of their natural order when they used to be herbs and round and round you go and it's a spiraling down a frequency until we really can't connect spiritual anymore spiritually anymore and therefore we're subject to the system and that is why I feel it's so important for people like yourselves who are teaching um, and sharing the information of, of shamanic arts uh, and getting back to nature. Uh, that is probably one of the, the one of the most important things that anybody could be doing at this time in our planet. You um, you have spoken about several uh, galactic galactic events that are happening at this time, and uh, the resulting frequency shifts that are affecting all of us. And I feel that. This awareness uh, that we're both speaking of right now is a part of that shift. Um, what what is causing these particular uh, frequency changes? Oh, we're we're living in a really exciting time. Um, I know everybody's sick of hearing about the Mayan calendar, but you know it was, it was uh, misinterpreted. It, it was going to be the end of the world. It was simply simply the end of the fourth world moving into the fifth world. But what the Mayan calendar charted the the Mayan. Uh, ancient Mayan elders that worked with the calendar were both shaman and uh, mathematicians. And what they were actually charting was the movement in our relative position in the galaxy and how these different positionings affect us in different ways and have set up a matrix for different things to happen on the planet. So say, for instance, um, the tides are affected by where the moon sits. Okay, and and we're affected. Our, our planet is affected by how our re relationship to the sun, our seasons, are created by that. So also, there's this intergalactic interplay of where we are in the galaxy. So for one thing, right now we're moving through a band of high frequency particles out, that's out in the galaxy that we periodically pass through. The last time we moved through through the photon band, it's called by many, was in the age of Leo, which was when we had the legends of uh, you know the legends of uh, the garden and being one with man. Uh, so and that was twelve thousand years ago. Is the last time that we were um, exposed to that high frequency. Also, we're in the process of moving into the age of Aquarius, uh, which is supposed to be one of unity and sovereignty. On top of it, our um, the North Pole is, through the progression of equinoxes, is moving to where it's pointing towards galactic center. And the black hole at galactic center sucks in all sorts of matter and then spews back out all sorts of gamma waves, radiation, and all that things that can be measured from the planet. If you can measure it from the planet, it's having an effect on the planet. And because our North Pole, which is where energy is drawn into the planet, is now facing that direction, that's raising the frequency as well. So basically, we're kind of in a pressure cooker right now. In a good way, I would hope. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I, I completely understand, and I'm, and I'm very aware of um, the reality of the fact that, you know, for, in order for something new to begin, something old has to end. 
And uh, again, I love the way that um, you explained the 2012 uh, Mayan calendar phenomenon that people um, might have misconstrued uh, it or misinformed many of us that, okay, well, the winter solstice, it's the end of the world. And uh, I personally never saw it like that. I always felt that it was the beginning of a new way of living and a new paradigm. And uh, we've been doing our best to bring on, you know, people like yourself who can explain uh, uh, the, the new paradigm and what it is that we can do to align with it. So I'm very grateful to hear um, how you explain the, the frequencies, what's happening. Uh, many of us, uh, again, just, uh, you know, listen to the alternative media where some of them may have been a little bit more fear-mongering. But the reality of it is, yes, I, I truly believe that uh, we are the, at the beginning of a new paradigm. This is not the end all. Uh, I feel the golden age is probably, oh, maybe several hundred to several thousand years away. But we are truly uh, going through the shifting process right now. And like with, uh, you know, giving birth, like a mother giving birth, it might be a little bit painful. So I'm not afraid to admit that, you know, some of the some of the ways that we've been living uh, are going to be stripped away and that might make us feel uncomfortable. And I think a lot of that uh, is coming to the surface, such as, like you said, the margarine is a perfect example. Everything we thought was right is now wrong. <laughs> but, uh, and I think that's a good thing because now we're going to be able to have the opportunity to go back to uh, who we are as uh, true spiritual beings and aligning with, um, uh, with our earth again. In reference to that, uh, I feel that um, going back to alternative healing, understanding the practices of nature, going back to the indigenous and uh, the traditional ways is one way of, uh, one very, very helpful way of doing that. Uh, we're very involved in working with um, uh, several organizations that work with the indigenous. And uh, we've had uh, several um, uh, speakers come on, even from the, from the Dogon tribe. Uh, and, and I love what you said about the energies because they, they believe in something called Bayou Ali, which is the uh, relationship, the energetic relationship between planets and galaxies and that play between that. So with that being said, I was wondering how you as, um, as a person who not only teaches uh, but practices the shamanic arts, how would you consider uh, explaining to someone who has never worked with shamanism, what is shamanism? How can you help define it for, for the lay person? Okay. Uh, bear in mind that this um, definition is not the anthropological one. It's the one that I've come up with, one that I've come up with having worked with it as long as I have. But what I've discovered shamanism to be, and this is so exciting, is it's uh, an organized set of rituals that's designed to help the practitioner focus their ability to manage matter at the quantum level. <laughs> I'm sorry? Three more. Uh, That's a wonderful yes, definition. Yes. Thank you for that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And um, and how does this help us? I mean, how does this help us right now during this time in our history? As we spoke of, uh, we're having a, a, a quantum shift basically happening, not only uh, around the world but around the galaxy and the universe. How can shamanism help us in this um, spiritual evolution? Well, it's amazing. Um, everything as we moved out of the light of the last age of um, when in Leo, when we were fully in the light, um, everything had to go from unity back into polarization. That's just the way it works. It works in cycles. And it's not, neither is right or wrong. It's just what happened. And so shamanism, like everything else, became more dogmatic and more limited. But during the times of um, the age of Leo, the shamanic practitioners were able to communicate through X points to people on the other side of the galaxies. That's how we have all this knowledge that there's no way we should have the knowledge that built the Mayan calendar. Um, because we didn't even have telescopes. How did we know this? Well, because we were communing with others. And what's really fun is now, as we're moving back into the age of light, shamanism can assist people becoming more whole through shamanic healing, but it can also work as a divination tool. So we're the old ways falling apart. That's just the natural order of things. But that leaves us not knowing what to expect before we could take the events of the past 
superimpose them on the present and pretty well get an idea of what was going to happen in the future. But the future is unprecedented at this point. However, through shamanism, through the shamanic journey, you can do divination where you literally go and dance at the quantum level where things are about to form and find your sweet spot within what's coming up. The application of divination. <laughs> <laughs> and it's important. And, 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 and that, in, in reference to that, I have to say that um, for, for those that um, are not involved in divination or whatnot, that um, for divination is not really fortune telling as far as I'm concerned. I find divination to be more of a this is the direction you're going in. And if you understand what you're doing, this is what the end result is going to be. And I'm wondering if that's uh, kind of what you're saying with these particular, these particular rituals. Yes, it is. The, the rituals actually are designed, we use our imagination, the landscape of our imagination, to paint a representation of what's happening at the quantum level. So at the quantum level, everything, you know, it, things don't operate like they do here. Electrons and protons are popping in and out of existence. And uh, it doesn't make sense to the linear mind what's going on there. So it's like a Mac trying to talk to a PC. It just doesn't work well. <laughs> so, so we need to zip the file in Unity, bring it back and unzip it in polarization to get an idea of what's going on. The ancient shamanic journey trance is an interactive dream that does exactly that. It accesses the quantum level. The imagination paints a representation of what's going on at the quantum level, in the, and, for, and then the mind makes sense of the journey. So then you interpret the journey just like you interpret a dream, and you get the answer to what's coming up. What's it going to look like if I take this action? What's it going to look like if I take that action? And pretty soon, you get to be a co-creator rather than just putting up with what happens. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I'm reflecting now as I'm listening to you speak. I'm reflecting on um, I was I was lucky enough to uh, go through a vision quest in my early twenties, and I will say it changed my entire life. Uh, too bad I didn't listen to the lessons that were learned in my early twenties, or life could have been easier during my twenties and thirties. However, uh, I did um, find that the visions that were given to me. Uh, we're, we're very much in line with what you're speaking of. Um, one of the visions that I had, and I, and I don't know if, um, if you want to share this or if you've done anything like that, whether I had any shamanic visions, but uh, I, I'm, I just had a conversation with someone who does um, shamanic trance work as well. And uh, there seems to be a, um, a, how shall I say, an underlying denominator uh, for those of us around the world that seem to be having these particular visions and are still getting them. And I attribute me and my visions coming from that vision quest I did 25 years ago. I'm aging myself now. And <laughs> <laughs> I, um, but one of the things is, is that uh, it, it seems that the, the visions come in contrast. Uh, the visions are showing that we are going through a, tra through a transition uh, that there is going to be much suffering, that there is going to be um, a, a collapse of the quote-unquote system, but yet there's also visions of paradise, of happiness, of, of, ut of utopian, uh, whatever the idea might be, whatever utopian is for you. But um, I'm just wondering if, uh, if uh, you're willing to share anything on that and if you've spoken with others uh, because I'm very much, uh, as well, I'm very uh, into the Jungian principle of collective unconscious, or subconscious, or I guess collective unconscious, I'm sorry. And um, I find that uh, that's, a, that's a very big role in, the, in what we're all doing here on the planet at this time, people like yourself and myself. Yes, increasingly, um, I say great minds travel in the same vein, but increasingly the people that I work with, my students and colleagues, will be having very similar journeys, will be having very similar messages. Um, the animals that come in ordinary reality, a raven will dive bomb you and you call up your friend and find out, yep, that you're picking up the same thing that I'm picking up. Um, we're becoming much more unified in that collective unconscious. And um, I think what's important though to recognize is it's a matter of choice of where we reside. Because because Einstein and, you know, said that uh, reality is frequency and that's all there is to it. Match the frequency of the reality you want and you can't help but get that reality. He says this isn't philosophy, this is physics. And so all of these realities are coexisting at the same time. The, you know, everything falling apart, the great suffering and utopia. 
they're coexisting. It's just a matter of us getting flexible enough and healed enough within our um, own beings to be able to accommodate the higher levels of frequency. If we get that expansiveness, we can reside where we choose to rather than be victimized where we are. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Thank you for saying that and, uh, and saying that live on the air. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I, I firmly believe that, um, that we are all, I mean, as a, as a united consciousness on this planet, that we're all creating uh, either our joys and or our suffering. And I mean that as a collective. Um, you know, many people speak of, you know, the coming quote unquote new world order. And then we have others that speak of, quote, unquote, the golden age. And I find that those who keep harping and looking for it find it on both, on both ends of the spectrum. Exactly. You know, what, 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 where, you, where you're pumping your intention, what frequency you're putting out there as reality is the reality that you're creating in your world. And that's, you know, it's physics. Like Einstein said, that's just physics. Absolutely. It's like, it's like the observer effect. They found that the observer actually has an effect on the outcome of the experiment. They thought mm -hmm. that the observer was inadvertently skewing the results. But no, when they did double-blind studies, they found out that indeed the belief system of the observer has an effect on the outcome. That means that we're dancing with a quantum level with our belief systems at all times. The key here is becoming conscious, and therefore we can consciously create versus unconsciously manifesting. Thank you for that. Absolutely. And with that being, also with that being said, I must say that um, the idea of changing our belief system is much easier as well. Um, yes. Yeah. When we believe that, you know, something is going to happen, we keep believing, we keep believing, we're, we're, we're creating that to happen. And many of us are so afraid of letting go of who we are and, allow, and, are, and not allowing a new belief system to come in that we don't get to 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 allow the expression of this new um, possibility of who we can be to come into play. Exactly. It's like we've been taught through guilt and shame that we're not okay the way we are. So we disconnect from the way we are and put on a front of who we are not that we think is going to be acceptable. But the frequency of that then is way diminished from what our potential is and we don't interact very well. So we get mixed results in our life. Because there's a big gap between us and who we, where, we're, where we're vibrating, if you will. And, you know, with that being said, uh, Gwilda, I, I, I believe and I live everything that we're speaking of here. But on the, on the layman's term, let, let's bring it down a vibration or two. Uh, life happens. Uh, we get upset. We get angry. We get frustrated. Uh, we get outraged. Uh, we get scared. Uh, all of us, uh, no matter what part of the journey that we're on, we're still human beings. And I can't help but wonder uh, if you have um, any advice for our, 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 our viewers and our listeners uh, to allow themselves to, to get past that. Uh, I find that many people who are, are waking up or quote unquote have awoken uh, are moving into, a, um, a, a, into the spiritual journey as, as defined by them. That, that we, and I remember for myself, and I'll speak personally, uh, that I remember as I was awakening that every time I got angry or every time I got outraged, I, I felt like I wasn't being spiritual. Mm -hmm. And I can't help but notice, and I don't know if you see this being a, a public figure, that people are very critical of, of those who call themselves spiritual when we act human. So I can't help but wonder what your thoughts are on that and what maybe you could offer our viewers and our listeners to, to get beyond trying to be perfect, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> That's such a, such a wonderful, wonderful question, Bernard, because there's four levels to our being, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And that's part of being human on the planet at this time. Um, but all four of them have been compromised in frequency through the past that we've been through and through the system that would like to keep us subject to it, et cetera, et cetera. One of the ways that we're kept subject to the system is we are taught to judge against our emotions, and therefore we stuff them and they become toxic. And so we are either pretending we don't have any, we're so far above that, or we're jumping up and down and dumping something on somebody that's, you know, 16 years worth of, worth of stuff that they just happen to be the unhappy one to trigger. Neither one of those is a balanced place. Emotion, joy, and sorrow, the sine wave that they create, are what open up 
open us up to life, to experience. You go out there in nature, again, there's our, there's our litmus test. Look at a mother bear when you get between her and her cubs. It's nothing pretty. Okay, or I go walking up and uh, come over a ridge and scare some deer. They run. But if I sneak over the ridge and peek, they're grazing again. And if I get out of the way of the mother bear's cubs, she just walks off and doesn't hold a grudge. That's natural, clean expression of this emotional realm that's part of who we are. To try to deny that is to cut off a quarter of who we are and to disconnect from a lot of our power. If we can't have passion for life, we can't manifest. Very true, very true. And, and I thank you for that. Uh, I'm looking at the chat and they're very happy that we're talking about this particular topic. Um, it, it just seems very strange to me. And I was one of those people, you know, like I said in the beginning, I wanted to have nothing to do with, uh, as some people call it, the shadow self or the dark side or, or whatever you want to call it. And um, I remember the more I kept trying to push it away, the more it had control over my life. And as with anything, the more you put attention to something, the more it's going to rear its ugly head. And uh, finally, a, a te a, another teacher had said to me, well, you need to embrace it, love it, and tell it you accept it. And then you'll see you, it will lose control over you. And very true. The more, the, the more that I play with my, well, quote, unquote, shadow self, I realize it's a part of who I am. I, I'm not spiritual 24-7. I get angry. I laugh. I, I say, you know, uh, bad jokes and poor taste, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're just, uh, you know, allowing that dance between the polar opposites as I feel a part of that balance that you were talking about earlier. Absolutely, because you see, one of the major principles, every, every chakra we have, every cell we have, every organ we have, expresses according to a toroidal field. A toroidal field is built, well, there's a whole bunch of mathematics behind it, but basically it also needs positive and negative spinning around a neutral pole. That creates a toroidal field, and toroidal fields have the potential of uh, perpetual motion. And that's what a lot of the new um, energy sources coming up are. Well, why am I going into this? Well, this is why. The neutral in the human being is acceptance of heart, of neutrality, looking at every aspect of us with openness and acceptance, because they're not bad unless you get stuck there or avoid it altogether. Then the spinning stops between the positive and the negative, the toroidal field falls, and we're powerless. The key here is embracing every aspect, but not being controlled by any of it. Absolutely. Um, I, I forgot who was, uh, I believe it's Joseph Campbell that talked about um, living the dance of life, but being the observer of it and not being swept up into it. Yes, yeah, so beautifully put. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, one of my mentors, I loved, I loved him as a, as a college, uh, during my college years. <laughs> again, <laughs> a, uh, aging myself again. But <laughs> um, let's move on and talk a little bit about this, um, this transformation that is happening within all of us, that is happening around the planet. And uh, when those of us are on the path, of spiritual evolution. So could you share with us what is your definition of spiritual evolution and what does consciousness have to do with this evolution? Very nice. Um, spiritual evolution to me is the process of becoming more whole, embracing all of, our all, of, all of our aspects so that we have much more mobility of frequency. The more mobility of frequency we have, the more, we, more realities we have access to. And the more realities we have access to, the more we can evolve as individuals. Um, and that, that's what I view as spiritual evolution. Give me the second half of that question. Oh, um, it, and this is probably uh, the one more for me because I feel that I agree with this so much more, is uh, how consciousness has a role in this uh, evolution. Oh, so perfect. Okay, so here's how consciousness has a role in it. I said that we were manifesting our reality. The problem is we're manifesting it most, mostly unconsciously. When we had to separate from ourselves out of shame and paint on a picture to please the masses, we became unconscious of most of who we are. And that part of us that, that we're unconscious of is out there running amok in our lives, manifesting at random, okay? So the key to becoming more conscious is the key of becoming more conscious of not only who and what we are, but of what we're intending and what our motivation 
emotions are in any given moment. Because I might be saying, I want to be a spiritual being, but what I might really be saying on the deep level is, I'm tired of feeling ashamed and guilty, and I want to separate myself from that. That's not being spiritual. That's being separated. And that's a very, very, very good point. Um, especially for someone uh, either early on in the path or someone who's young, uh, I remember, again, I'm going to go back to my early spiritual path as um, I did separate and um, I was very much, uh, it felt like, I didn't realize it until my mid-twenties that I was trying to separate myself from my physical self until I went to a healer and uh, they did a chakra balancing on me and they said, you are in your head, you need to come back to the ground, what are you avoiding? And uh, so that's a very good point that you made, that we can't, we're not evolving if we're avoiding. And exactly. being conscious of what we are, what we do, and how we feel is a part of this evolution, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, we think of the chakra system as simply existing in seven point, points in the mm -hmm. body. And when, during the long dark, that's exactly all that was there because that was all the light that was available. But the design of the chakra system extends above and below the body into infinity. And this time of enlightenment, we're given the opportunity to start opening up increasing numbers of chakras to channel in increasing bandwidths of light. The key is we have to open up equally down as we do up. And the, the teachings that we've had or the way that we've taken the teachings is all about higher and higher. Well, if you go higher and higher and you don't connect lower and lower and keep your body, your heart in the center of the equation, it's the direction, it's, it's, it's the path to madness. I couldn't agree more. Um, well, I couldn't agree more. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but um, I, I love that you said that because... Um, I think that's one of the main things that uh, we teach a consciousness class here, and uh, one of the most important things that we do is um, as we grow, as we expand upward, we expand downward as well. So thank you for that validation, and uh, thank you for being clear on that because it's very true. It's very, very true. Um, especially now, I find that with the world changing the way that it is so quickly, and Again, you know, people are very um, controversial when it comes to technology and whatnot. I feel that um, the internet and, uh, you know, resources like the GIC or Facebook or, or other communities and other networks are, are being very helpful in this process for us to evolve because we get to share information. But that's only the, um, the, the, uh, I guess, text or video information. It's not, well, again, it's energetic. However, there is an energetic change going on in the world. And I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit about how you feel um, about this particular time. Is this the best opportunity that we've had in a while for us to evolve spiritually more than any other time in history? Yes, and it, it, the best in about 12,000 years, actually. Um, and what's interesting is, as you move around the ages, when you're in the age of Leo, it's in the masculine age of light. And then as you continue on around the, in the long dark, you're in like the age of Taurus, which is the masculine imbalance. Okay, not men, just masculine. Then you move around to Aquarius. It's the feminine age of light. And now as we, when we continue on around, and, and years, thousands of years from now, we'll move into the age of Scorpio, which will be in the feminine imbalance. And then on back to Leo. And we cycle through this again and again and again and again. Each age has its own lessons. Um, but when we're coming into a time of unity, what's so fun is it doesn't matter if it's technology or if you're out there lighting a fire and doing ceremony. All of it can be used for unity. All of it. And I love the internet. I love these things that's being provided because you and I, we get to know each other here. We get to have a conversation that we would never have otherwise. And there'll come a time when we possibly don't need this kind of connection. We can just have those conversations, but we aren't there yet. So it's a beautiful bridge. So there's no right or wrong, just a matter of proper usage. I couldn't agree more. Um, we spoke to, um, I forgot who it was. We had someone on a program either several weeks ago or a couple months ago. And they were speaking about technology and um, and uh, they were even speaking about uh, the Egyptian placement of using power grids and whatnot as far as their their uh, monuments and, and you know, energy uh, like obelisks and whatnot. And um, 
it was said that uh, th that they were utilizing artificial technology because they hadn't evolved to that point where they didn't need it. So I can't help, I guess it was uh, in reference to like Atlantean uh, consciousness or whatnot, but I can't help but feel maybe that's what we're doing now with, um, with the internet and things like that. Perhaps this is our, our training wheels uh, until we have the ability to, you know, have conversations telekinetically, you know? <laughs> Absolutely, it is. And it's, you know, anymore I can tell when somebody's about to email me, you know, because that we've had that constant, uh, instant, um, not somebody thinking about me and a week later they get on the phone or a letter comes, but they think about me, they instantly email. And so I'm able to start training myself as to what I'm really feeling when somebody pops into my mind. And, you know, um, my friend that holds space for me while I, while I do the interviews, she was leaving her house, stopped dead, went back inside and grabbed her computer. <laughs> I was trying to get a hold of her, but her phone was dead. I said, we need to check Skype because I'm not, I'm, you know, because like you said, they downloaded a new one. Well, she, she picked it up, picked up what I was thinking, okay, that I need this. And more and more and more we're seeing this, but we're being trained by the instant um, uh, communication system that was available through telephones, cell phones, the internet. Yeah. And of course, like any technology, it can be used for good or bad and, 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 and abused. I, 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 I will say one of my frustrations is watching people just staring down at their iPhones all the time. I'm like, look around. You're, it's spring. Look at the beautiful flowers. <laughs> <laughs> Put down yeah. your iPhone. Look around. <laughs> <laughs> I took I took a picture of, of a family gathering a little while ago, and it was like all these faces looking down with a glow on them from the from the, the things, and nobody was talking to anybody. <laughs> right, right, right. It was pretty right. humorous. Yeah. Um, tell us. Uh, uh, actually, someone is uh, asking, what are those four parts again? Could you synopsize? Sure. Physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. There are different aspects of our expression, and they all have to be in harmony with one another. The key to evolution is to remove the restrictions in each one and, and then cycle around. As you remove restrictions in each of those levels, then your overall frequency can raise. That's beautiful. Um, I can't help but, um, but share what uh, my teacher told me in my, the very, very, very beginning of my path. Uh, and it's funny um, how we're having this conversation almost 30 years later um, that uh, my first focus was on shamanism. And um, my teacher had told me a true shaman has his foot on the physical, material, emotional, and spiritual plane all at once without any veil between them. Exactly. I was, and you're just saying that exactly again. I love it. I love it. Full circle. I, I can die now. Okay, no kidding. <laughs> not allowed. Not allowed. <laughs> Too much work to do, but exactly. that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Uh, talk to me a little bit about um, the. You know, we talked a little about a, a little bit about the changing of the chakras and um, how during this time the chakras are changing. Uh, some people don't know what the chakras are. Some people don't understand why they are important. Uh, for me personally, uh, it gives me a, uh, a reflection point where I will do like a scan on my body and I can feel where something is not necessarily uh, functioning right, if there's some kind of blockage. But not everybody practices what I do and do the body scan every night. So for those of us that really don't know uh, what chakras are, or how we can become more familiar with them. Can you explain why and how they relate to our evolution and our personal empowerment? You bet. Um, the physical chakra system, each chakra is anchored in an endocrine gland. The endocrine glands in the body direct all the functionings of the body. We don't have to pay attention to that. They take care of it for us. Um, and the chakras then take the frequency that we're developing in our endocrine glands and express it into the quantum level. So say, for instance, if I'm wanting something to happen, my will center, which is the yellow, which is right in your diaphragm, will actually, the toroidal field of my chakra in the will center will interact with the quantum level in order to push it that direction. I do demonstrations with my, my students and let them stand in front of me and say, now, what does it feel like right now and they go oh i feel overpowered well i'm you know pushing my will at them because i've learned to 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 consciously do these just like you breathe automatically but you can also choose to take a big deep breath or not um 
What's interesting is they uh, work by frequency, but they express according to frequency or light. So there's a, a tone that resonates with a well-tuned chakra. There's a color that resonates with a well-tuned chakra. And that's why we have the colors that go along with them. What's going on now that there's more light present, the chakra system above and below our body, should we choose to process and, and heal, is starting to open up. That means that a larger bandwidth of light is available for every chakra below it and above it, uh, which enhances those chakras as well. Now let's take it one more step. Our DNA is built on light. It's light code. And the, you know, scientists say, oh, we've got a bunch of junk DNA. No, what we have is a bunch of DNA that has not been activated because the light has not been present. So what we can become as we evolve, is, and it's a choice. You don't have to evolve. You don't have to. But should you choose to, I think our capabilities are going to amaze us. Oh, me too. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I, and, I, and again, I, I share this because I, I've seen the vision. I, I've seen, I've had the dreams, the lucid dreams. And I've had the messages of, of seeing us just as these wonderful beings of light. And that is why I have so much faith in humanity. We have so much potential that that is at literally around the corner and at our fingertips the moment we can get past this um, uh, oppression, for lack of a better term. I call it spiritual oppression. And uh, we're getting close to the end, and I'm sure uh, a lot of our um, listeners and viewers are very interested in what you have to say about this. I, when, when I had my, my vision quest, uh, the, I saw these beings, and uh, they call themselves the emissaries of light, yada, yada, yada. Everyone has emissaries of light or light workers or whatnot. However, these particular beings showed me how the quote-unquote powers that be were making it impossible to raise our vibration, or at least making it very difficult. That they implemented this uh, system of control, of fear, of division, um, and I understand that uh, you yourself see our current system as being opposed to the, to the evolution of the individual on a spiritual matter. So I wonder uh, if you could share with us what, what have you seen and, and uh, what are your feelings on it? And, and, and maybe we can round it out by, by giving us some uh, options on to move past it. Okay, great. Uh, it's a huge subject, and I'll have to really summarize. I've got a whole chapter on it in the book okay. uh, called called Smoke and Mirrors. <laughs> but <laughs> um, the system developed just naturally during the age of the fourth world when we were, you know, it was a lower frequency, and we had to kill to live. We had to be parasitical in nature. And it's no surprise that a parasitical system was built at that time because that was the energy present. But that system is uh, relies on exploiting um, their at the very top, you look at the pyramid, at the very top is the all-seeing eye. There's much wealth and much knowledge spread among few. At the bottom of the pyramid, where most, most of us reside, there's very little wealth and very little information spread among many. And this system is developed and has been supporting those at the top for eons. But now, as we're getting ready to move into the era of unity, that's th threatening the powers that be. It's threatening the system at hand. And things, checks and balances have been put in place to try to prevent the individual from stepping out of the system and evolving into our potential. Because right now, we depend on the system to provide for us. If we become co-creators, we manifest what we need. We don't need the system. The system will fail. And so that's why there's resistance to it. What we can do if we choose to step out of the system, we don't have to, but if we choose, is we need to do things on the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual level to raise our frequency. Physically, of course, there's all the things we can do about pure water, make sure our air cleaners are clean, eat organic, um, you know, and on and on, you know, avoid artificial stuff. On the emotional level, we can embrace and process our emotions and responsibly manage them rather than deny them. On the mental, we can open up uh, to other ideas, other viewpoints, other possibilities. And spiritually, we can work with our chakric system to open up to greater uh, frequencies of light. I think shamanic healing is the key to all of this myself. Oh, thank you. And I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I totally agree uh, with the the aspect of shamanic healing for for being being a key to to move us through this um, 
It, it, for me, it's just like a gelatinous uh, blockage. It, we can push right through it. It's just a matter of doing the work to push through it. Uh, it exactly. reminds me a, a little bit about, you know, the Ghostbusters, the ectoplasm, the gook. and It's soft. It's malleable. We just have to get past it. And uh, you're, you're right. The shamanic practices are very much a part of that. Um, I was going to say something, and I completely forgot about that. But um, anyway, uh, as far as... Um, Oh, I know what I wanted to say. I'm sorry. Uh, we didn't get to we didn't get to talk much about it, and we've only got a few more minutes. But um, on a physical level, uh, and we, there's so much emphasis right now in the alternative spirituality slash. Oh wait, I'm sorry. Scratch that. I do remember what I wanted to say because it's a very important point. The fact that, and and I'm noticing now um, more and more and more and more. Uh, we talk about the system and those that are, you know, waking up to changing it, waking up to moving past it. There seems to be so much hatred and fear of um, spiritual work. Uh, we get called devil worshippers. We get called satanic. We get called Luciferian. And I can't help but wonder if that's a part of something that was put in by the system to scare everyone away from this particular technology. Yes, it absolutely was. I mean, even the myths of the devil and everything uh, under the earth, you know, Dante's Inferno, everything underneath the earth, it separates us from our beautiful mother, from, from, from her light. That's true. And um, without the balanced light, we can't generate. We cannot. Without positive and negative in equal, equal measure rotating around total acceptance of heart, we cannot generate spiritual power and we will be forever subject to the system. Yes, those are the checks and balances put in place and people are afraid. They've been taught to be afraid and it keeps us subject to. Yeah, absolutely. Every time I get, um, you know, we have a very large Facebook um, page and we're linked out with uh, many other different pages and, and every couple of days we'll get, um, we'll get someone who calls us satanic or something like that. And, and I just want to respond. I, I, and of course I have self-control and I try <laughs> not to. Every once in a while I do, but I automatically think, you know what? They're winning. When you think like this, when you are afraid of learning about your 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 body, your energetic field, the the technology that's being presented to you, they call it the occult because it's not. E they don't call it the occult because it's evil. They call it the occult because it's hidden information. That is exactly what the occult is. And when people are afraid of it, I feel that, like you said, it is a check and balance that's being put into place. I feel that their fear is allowing, is, is perpetuating even further that particular uh, oppression that was created and generated by the system. Uh, I, it's just a comment, but if you'd like to comment, by all means. <laughs> yes, well, it's, um, I, I do see it as a check and balance put in place by the system. And just from my viewpoint, uh, I don't think Creator is so small that all that is created here isn't part of the Creator. I don't see anything evil. I just see imbalances. And if a person shuts down and goes to one direction or the other, they become extremely imbalanced. And then that can be damaging to the people around them. But it's not evil. It's just imbalance. Right, right. It's a part of the all. It's a part of the everything. Um, and, and as we uh, wrap it up, uh, this has gone by very quickly. I could talk to you for another two hours. This is wonderful. Thank you very <laughs> Thank you. much, Gwilda. What a pleasure to talk with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and as we wrap it up, I, I want to talk a, a little bit about your book. I love the title. Uh, we're still here, so now what? <laughs> or, or so, I'm sorry, say it for us. So we're still here, now what? There we go. I love that title. And, and I, it's kind of me on... A, December 22nd, 2012. <laughs> and many people, actually, many, many people probably felt that way. But um, could you tell us a little bit about your book? Uh, what's it about? Um, and uh, what, where can we find it? Okay. You can find it on Amazon.com. Um, and it's about spiritual uh, evolution and personal empowerment now that we have the light available. And it's step-by-step. Uh, -step. It, it gives all the concepts that we've been talking about, but it also gives very real solutions on how to start moving forward with the support that we have now with the light available. Um, it also gives instruction on the basic shamanic journey. 
Oh, really nice. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Uh, and with that being said, can you tell us a little bit about about uh, your work in Colorado? I'm, I'm fascinated to know what you do uh, on a on a day to day. Oh, sure. I'm a shamanic practitioner, uh, but I'm also a shamanic instructor. I have Path Home Shamanic Art School, which is a Colorado State certified occupational school of the shamanic arts, and I'm a certified shamanic instructor through the state. So we're kind of one of a kind. Um, and we have online um, classes. We also have online spiritual healing. We have certified shamanic practitioners that have trained with me for years that do long-distance work so people can use the skills that they have to help them evolve in their world. You know, I, I really, first of all, I want to, again, I just want to thank you. I just feel such a wonderful uh, vibe and connection with you today. And the other thing I really want to thank you is um, your the way that you express yourself uh, through the shamanic uh, practices, uh, we have so many right now that are uh, calling themselves uh, shamans and medicine people and, and whatnot, frauds, for lack of a better term. And we're seeing so many of them being, um, being brought out into the light, uh, for lack of a better term, unfortunately. And uh, your, your, your reverence and your respect toward, toward the, uh, the work and uh, t toward the indigenous by not um, um, selling, you know, your fifth generation, you know, mother medicine woman or anything like that. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's, so, it's so heartening. It is very heartening and uh, heart tending, not heartening, heart tending. <laughs> <laughs> so I thank you for that. And all of us thank you for your, for your generosity of your time, not only with our show today, uh, but for the planet itself, uh, your your presence on this planet is very much necessary at this time. Your your integrity is very important, especially uh, when it comes to the shamanic arts. And uh, we're very, very grateful that uh, you're doing what you're doing and how you're doing it. So thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Bernard, and thank you for what you're bringing. It's invaluable. Thank you very much. And uh, before we go, what is a, a website where people can follow up with you? Okay, um, it's my first and last name, gwildawiyaka.com, so okay. it's G-W-I-L-D-A-W-I-Y-A-K-A.com. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, we're going to wrap things up, and uh, again, we've thanked each other uh, profusely, and I'm very grateful to make your acquaintance and, and, and connect with you energetically. I feel like uh, it's an old friend coming to visit and I'm sitting here having coffee with them and uh, again uh, gwildawiaka.com please go check it out and uh, look, check out her book I love the title <laughs> we're still here <laughs> so now what <laughs> anyway um, I'm going to be back uh, on um, Tuesday on Revolution Radio and we're going to be speaking finally uh, with Maria Wheatley, and she is going to be speaking with us about the ancient sites and energetic sites of Ireland and England. And uh, we we had had her book. She got sick last month, uh, but we are rescheduled. I know many of you were looking forward to that particular interview. She's going to be with us for two hours, and we're going to be talking about everything from the ancient sites as well as dowsing principles, energy lines, ley lines, and uh, healing. So make sure to check, check us out on the Jess Bernard Show on uh, Revolution Radio this Tuesday. And those of you that are watching, if you missed any of this, uh, we will be archiving it and putting it up on our YouTube channel. Uh, I'm looking at starting to release uh, uh, videos on Tuesday and Tuesday and Thursday, I'm sorry. So the Thursday videos were released on Tuesday. The Tuesday videos were released on Thursday. So look for this on our YouTube channel uh, next Tuesday. We thank you so, so much for joining us. And as always, please remember that all of our programs are funded by you and only by you. Uh, if you have the ability, please make a donation so we can keep up these wonderful medium programs to speak with wonderful people like Wilda Wiaka and many more. We love you. I love you. Thank you, and have a wonderful, wonderful night. Bye-bye.